Well, they, they told me that they uh, had saved the best for last, and then I figured out that the reason why they had me on last was because they figured nobody would be still here. And, uh, but I'm absolutely amazed that uh, you are still here after this incredible week. Are you, are you about brain dead by this time? Can you absorb any more? Can you tarry with me one hour? <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought I was going to have the last word. And I started to tell John a little bit about my intentions of messing with the three R's a little bit tonight. And uh, so John asked, he kind of ex exercised chairman prerogative, and so he's going to come up after me and straighten out anything that I might mess up tonight. So I won't get the last word, but I'll, I'll give you a good shot. Uh, many of us uh, are veterans and, and good friends that have developed over the last uh, 10 years since CCDA has uh, been in existence, 10 or 12, I guess now. Uh, the encouraging thing to me is, uh, is the presence of new troops, however, fresh blood, uh, with new vitality and vigor, and uh, it's such a joy to, for me to be able to spend these days with you. Uh, I had a speech prepared, and, and I decided that I wouldn't, uh, I, would, I would rather just kind of talk from my heart tonight. Uh, when we got into this work, 10, some of us 20, some of us 30, 40 years ago, the cities of our nation were in very, very desperate shape. We had experienced a 40-year hemorrhage of resources and leadership out of our inner city communities. Our systems uh, had virtually failed. We were beginning to admit as a society that our policies had become bankrupt. Uh, communities were laying in waste. Uh, crime and drugs were epidemic. Uh, the crack epidemic was sweeping the land. Some were wondering if there was even any remedy for this epidemic that was wasting a whole generation of urban young people. There were books being written like, Can Our Cities Be Saved? There was serious talk that maybe maybe the cities were beyond reclamation and we might as well put our energies in the outlying areas. It was in that dark hour that CCDA was born. Some called us reckless uh, for even suggesting that middle-class folks uh, be encouraged to move into dangerous inner-city communities. Uh, it was bold enough to ask uh, whites to do that, but, but to ask minorities who had for generations struggled to get out of the city to consider moving back, uh, that was just, it was preposterous. And yet that was the call that went out. And many of us here tonight and thousands like us all over the country responded to that call and we located in inner city areas and have been agents of transformation. For us, the last decade has been a very inspiring period of time. Maybe we paid some high prices. Uh, maybe we sacrificed some things that were dear to us. But we have discovered afresh and anew the power of community. We've learned something about that. We've learned that children that are born into depressing ghetto areas can blossom and flourish with some nurture and spiritual guidance. New life can emerge in young people and their parents. We have created some wonderful ministries. We've developed some wonderful inner city 
uh, mixed income and racially diverse congregations. We've dabbled in some housing. Some of us have tried some businesses. And we've brought some fresh hope to the city. In the process, I think we have learned a lot about ourselves as well. Some of us have gotten in touch with some racism so deeply d embedded down inside of us that we didn't even know it was there and have recognized that it'll take the rest of a lifetime for it to ever be purged. We've gotten in touch with some of that in ourselves. We have discovered that there were messianic complexes in some of our spirits that motivated us seemingly for noble reasons and yet eventually illuminated our kingdom, personal kingdom building motivations. We've learned some things about ourselves. And some of us have realized that God's call to us to move into the city was as much about our own salvation as the salvation of those to whom we went. I think we've come a long way in a very short and important period of history. But the coming decade will be different from the past decade. There is something very significant changing in our cities. This new millennium has, has dawned with an optimism that has not been there for many years. The first sociological books to look at our cities that have come out just this year are entitled Comeback Cities and Cities on the Rebound. They begin to document the new life that is starting to emerge in our urban areas and, and to our surprise we find such amazing things like crime is down and has been on a decline now for, just, for a few years. It doesn't look that way sometimes in our neighborhood. It certainly doesn't look that way on the evening news. An interesting report uh, recently put out by the LA Times was documenting a 13% decrease in crime nationally over the past five years. And during the same period of time, a 336% increase in the media coverage, TV coverage, uh, in the evening news. It's in the, it, it, it's, it's, if it bleeds, it leads kind of mentality. But behind the news media, things are starting to look brighter. Some of our neighborhoods are springing back to life. We see it. Some businesses are starting to return to our inner city communities. Do you know in our community, the first big star, it's our major grocery uh, chain in, in uh, Atlanta, a new big star is being built in our community. The first, first of its uh, major store in 40 years. That's new life. And that is not just Atlanta. That's happening in your cities as well. Businesses are starting to return. The systems which have failed are now starting to change. Do you know about the HUD policies that have dramatically changed? Where for many years, generations in fact, the policy was to warehouse the poor in isolated compounds. That policy has changed, and some of those housing projects in this and other cities are coming down, and in, and in their place are mixed income developments that are coming out of the ground. That's brand new. That means that the children of the less advantaged are going to be able to be raised alongside the children of the more advantaged, and it gives us a historic opportunity to minister in a more hopeful environment. The, even the public education system is beginning to crack at its foundations. 
The states are now experimenting with vouchers. The whole charter school legislation that is being implemented throughout the country is beginning to erode an educational system, particularly in the cities that has failed and yet is still very resistant to change. But in fact, change is coming. Sprawl has finally reached the point of diminishing returns. The nation is getting tired of sitting in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic for hours waiting to get in and out of the city. And we're finally discovering that there are some advantages to living in the city. And so what we are beginning to see is uh, such things as loft developments. Uh, they probably are working their way into your communities as, as they are mine. Why these changes taking place in this moment in time? The researchers are baffled. They say things like better policing, community policing. They say things like tougher, longer jail sentences. They say things like the emergence of CDCs in communities. But in fact, their conclusions are, this is a mystery. We just do not know why this is happening. I think I know why it is happening. If you have toured this city this week uh, and seen some of the marvelous ministries that are not on the national radar screen, and you've seen the concerts of prayer and other prayer networks that have been going on in this city and throughout the country, you will begin to realize that underneath the, these changes in our society, there is a movement of God that is unique in our time, and it is changing history. It's hard to document. It doesn't fit the scientific method. But in fact, the Spirit of God is moving in some new and remarkable ways. Researchers say, we don't understand why. I think we say, we do understand why. The 21st century has dawned brightly on the cities of this land. Does it mean we have no problems? Does it mean that there aren't huge challenges that lay before us? But it does mean that there is a sense of optimism that is surely growing. American cities have developed in the last 50 years differently from most of the major cities of the world. Most major cities have the wealth concentrated in the heart of the city and poverty is out at the edges of the city. And people move in from the rural and small town areas and get a foothold in the outlying districts, if it's in developing country, in shanty towns, and try to work their way into the, into the heart of the city where, the, uh, where money and power and opportunity reside. U.S. cities have developed uniquely different from that. We have developed like, like a donut with a hole in the middle and the dough around the outside. The money has moved to the edges, to the ring, to the suburbs, leaving in the middle uh, our poverty, a dark hole in many respects. But in this moment in history, a great reversal is just beginning. Our cities, it is predicted that over the next 50 years, will invert to follow the pattern of world-class cities elsewhere, other countries, and that wealth will begin to concentrate in the heart of the city, and poverty will start to move out to the outlying areas. We've seen it. It's already beginning. We cannot yet call it a trend, but the signs are surely there. In Atlanta, for example, we have had a declining population for the last 30 years, until this year. And for the first time, we have had just a little uptick in population growth. Only 2,500 people. 
The major difference, however, this time is that they are people of means. That is a new phenomenon, an early sign that something is happening in our city. A great reversal is beginning to, to take place. We, uh, we call that gentrification. You know that word. That word gentry is a, an old English 16th century word that described the, the wealthy landowners in an agrarian society. They weren't royalty, they were just a notch below royalty, but they controlled the land. They, gentry meant landed once. Now that disappeared in the late 1700s in England uh, when the Industrial Revolution uh, made, its, uh, made its start and uh, the land in the rural areas was not the main source of the economy. It became the industry of the cities. And so the gentry just disappeared. But that word has resurfaced in our time, gentrification, to mean the return of the landed ones, the property owners, those who will move into our communities and buy property that has uh, maybe been abandoned or neglected for a generation or two and fix them up and restore them. Gentrification. Gentrification will, will soon become, is becoming now, a new social norm in our country, in our cities. It will replace white flight and, blight f and bright flight that, uh, that we have worried about and wrung our hands about. That period of time is about gone and gentrification will be the new social norms in the decades ahead. You see it happening already in your communities, I'm sure, just as I do. Real estate developers are discovering that there's a, there's a market here, and they're buying up old warehouses, and buying up blocks of property, and buying up vacant houses, and developing new gated communities. And in the old warehouses, uh, avant-garde restaurants, and, and artist studios, and uh, loft housing is coming into places that has been large, have been largely abandoned in our recent history. Our challenge in the days to come is not to recruit middle income people to come into the city. Our challenge is how will we retain the poor who are now in our communities? That will become the challenge of the future. The market is going to attract the middle class back to the cities. The poor will soon be displaced. Gentrification is a good word for our city leaders. It means the return of a tax base. Gentrification is a frightful word to the poor because it means displacement. I've had the opportunity this past year of traveling around and visiting uh, in a, a urban ministries in a number of cities. And one of the problems that I hear coming up over and over again uh, from young ministers and youth workers who, who are really committed to uh, evangelizing and discipling kids and raising up indigenous leadership and uh, all of those uh, good community development principles, the thing that I hear over and over again is our kids are moving and we're spending more and more time in vans going around to pick them up, trying to just keep them together, trying to keep continuity in our relationship. But they're moving. Gentrification is not going to be a friend of current urban ministries. It means the displacement of our people, a, a scattering, uh, a word that has great meaning to Jewish people, a diaspora. 
a scattering, a dislodging, and uh, an, an unchosen displacement to other places, probably places where they are not welcome. A diaspora of the poor is coming in our cities. Here's where I might get into trouble with John. Relocation has been one of the basic tenets, one of the three R's of the CCDA movement. But think about this. It may be our relocation into communities of need that actually spark the fires of gentrification in that community that will ignite and displace the poor that are there. When Peggy and I, 20 years ago, after, after listening to John and becoming convinced that we should move into the inner city, did so. We built a house on the site of an old burnt down boarding house. Our suburban friends just shook their heads. They knew that we were never going to get our investment back out of this house. But that wasn't why we went to the city for a good housing investment. We were called to serve among our friends and neighbors who were entrapped in poverty. And so we went and we built a house. But shortly after we built our home, uh, we noticed that other houses in the block and surrounding blocks were starting to be renovated. And we felt pretty good about that. And then just down the block, a developer built a whole row of really nice townhomes. And we felt ecstatic about that. And we would take evening walks all around the community and just marvel at the new life that was coming back to our neighborhood. And we knew that our property value was indeed going up, and we felt very good. But in the church, just down the street, when we would gather for fellowship and worship, we started hearing prayer requests that we had not heard before. Please pray for us. Our rents have just doubled and we can't afford to stay here anymore. Please pray for us. We've just received a notice that we have to move out. Our house is being sold. Please pray for us. We don't know where we're going to go. We have just been priced out of our apartment. And it began to dawn on me that what was happening was that our property value was pulling up the rents of the very people we were there to serve among. As our wealth increased, their poverty was intensifying in inverse proportions. We were their problem. It was a sobering moment to realize that even with our best intentions, we were the ones that were causing the displacement and scattering of those we had come to serve. Well, that pushed us into a housing ministry. We had no intention of doing housing. I know nothing about housing. I should not be in that business. But Opal Guerin came into our church one Wednesday noon to our little prayer group, and she was weeping, and she said, we've lived here 14 years, and now I've received a notice. We have to move. They're going to sell our house. And I, I tell you that I could not sit there and pray with hope. And I quietly left that circle, and I went up, and I got on the phone, and I started calling Christians from churches around the city, and I said, we've got a problem here. And later that week, 20 gathered, and I said, here's the problem. We're pricing our poor right out of the market. This is Opal's situation. Her house with 60-some-odd code violations is now worth more to sell than it is to get rent from. 
can we do anything? That group committed themselves to at least pray about it. They went and walked through Oval's house, and he said, this is a terrible investment. But they said, let's pray about it. And a week later, they came back together, and they said, let's buy it. And they put up $20,000 from their different churches and bought Opal's home. And we said to her, good news, you don't have to move out. We now own your house. Now we were slumlords. <laughs> we owned a house with 67 code violations. That is not a problem for the family of God. Opal's extended family from all over the city started coming and showing up on weekends and after work and started fixing on her house. And in just a few months, her house had been totally uh, remodeled, a new roof, a new heating system, new wiring, the, the floor rebuilt. And her house was not only code violation clean, but it was charming. And then we had a big celebration in the church, and, and everybody that had a hand in it gathered together, and Opal came, and we, we sang to God be the glory, and we signed over into her name the title to that home for just what we had put in it. Her house payment was about half what her rent had been. She became a homeowner. And now as my property value was going up, so was Opal's. The problem was, it was too little, too late. There were only a handful of folks in the church who we were able to secure housing for or build housing for. The property values had skyrocketed too quickly. And even our suburban friends who, who shook their heads, they couldn't afford now to live in this community. There was little joy in gaining wealth for in our house at the expense of the poor. We began to learn we began to learn that compassion without justice can be a cruel hoax. Do you remember, do you remember what Micah said? He has shown you, O oh man, What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But to act justly meant that we had to be as concerned about an economic system that was working against the poor and in the favor of the gentry. We had to be as concerned about the redemption of that fallen system as we were concerned about the redemption of souls. Because systems that oppress people steal the soul and the hope of people. The big question for us, I believe, is can we as grassroots, urban, hands-on ministries do anything about the gentrification, the waves of gentry that are surely coming into our cities that will disperse and scatter the poor uh, to the outlying areas. Is there anything that we can really do about that? I think very little. Very little unless we rethink our strategies of ministry. If we content ourselves to do hands-on personal ministry of evangelism and discipleship and feeding and clothing, as good and as important as compassion is, it will not have a justice component to it. And without justice, the poor will surely be scattered. I think our heartbeat is absolutely right.
but our ministries will find themselves carried along with the migration streams of those who will be displaced and moved out to the outlying areas of the city. If we want to be migrant ministries, we'll keep on doing what we're currently doing in personal kinds of ministries. If we want to be agents of justice, if we want to accomplish gentrification with justice, we'll begin to add to our evangelism and discipleship activities those activities that will cause the system to change. Doing justice means changing systems. We are gifted to accomplish this. Now we have a wonderful array and pretty well developed urban ministry gifts. But there are a couple assets that we have that we probably have not utilized to their maximum. They are access and credibility. We have access to the people who make decisions in our cities. We may or may not know them personally, but we know some of the churches that they go to. Some of the supporting the churches that support our ministry. Those folks are sitting in those pews. We do have access. And with that access, there are policies that need to be changed. This whole charitable choice legislation that uh, we have been hearing about this week, we are the trustworthy guides, the folks that understand the community. We can do that better than anybody else. We know home builders that can build mixed income housing if rightly challenged and make a profit doing it. We know investors who can see a piece of land, buy it at the right price, hold on to it for a period of time, commit it to the work of ministry, the work of, of uh, building mixed income housing, and then sell it at a later point and get a great tax benefit from it. They can do that. The little neighborhood where we now live was 18 acres of land, and as a little ministry, we had no capacity to buy that kind of land. But three Christian businessmen said, why, why we could buy that, and they each put up $25,000 to buy this very cheap, but to us very expensive piece of land. They said, go ahead, develop it, uh, uh, do your ministry, uh, get some builders in here to build houses, and down the road, we will donate that land to you. And the appraised value was 350000 And they had some great tax advantage out of that. There are people in the pews who know how to make the system work and rightly challenged can make the systems work for justice in the city. And we know those people. I was at a Presbyterian church last week doing a stewardship talk for them, kind of rev folks up to give a little more. And uh, I, I just got a wild thought right at the end, and I just thought I'd throw it in there. And I said, you know, if you, if you folks really want to do something wild for the kingdom, why don't you come down into our community and, and buy a crack house? the worst house in our neighborhood, we can tell you where it is, find the worst house that is that, that, that wreaks terror on the rest of the community and buy it. And then come down on the weekends and fix it up and uh, get volunteers down there and then sell it to one of our families or a ministry couple so that they can start work with ministry youths out of that crack house. What do you think about doing something like that? Well, you know, there were these kind of puzzled, interesting looks that came on their faces. But after the meeting, two little groups, one group of older women and one group of older men came up to me and they said, we think we'd like to buy a crack house. We know those people. 
access and we have credibility we have the kind of credibility that pastors used to have that used to live in our communities whose kids used to go to the community schools and when the pastor stood up he had moral authority we have that kind of credibility I'm not sure we have used our gifts of access and credibility to their fullest quite yet. The good news is, while the Spirit of God is moving in the cities and the structures are undergoing pretty dramatic change, the Spirit of God is moving in the hearts of those lay people out in the pews, some rich, some poor, but those with marketplace talents who under the Lordship of Christ can be the new missionary force for the cities. Let me tell you one little kingdom playground that has happened in our community. A kingdom playground is a little small geographic area, might be as big as a house, might be as big as a, a block. But it's where the children of God come and they gather and they bring their best toys and tools and talents and they and they have fun creating eternal things. It's a kingdom playground. Sitting in right in the middle of our community, right up on a hill where you can see it, is a is a monstrous old derelict prison. Built right after the Civil War, it was where if you were so poor you couldn't pay your fines, they would send you out there to work on the chain gangs, a place of incredible suffering and inhumanity. Housed men, women, and children as young as 10 years of age in big unsegregated wards, years in which the syphilis rate was as high as 90% among the inmates. Always rumors that family members had been sentenced to the old stockade never to be heard from again. It wasn't until years later after the property was sold off and the highway was cut across the property that the bulldozer operators kept turning up the skeletal remains of people, more than 50, in that one excavation. No idea of who they were, how they got there. The city finally decided to tear it down and rid the stigma of this image of the old South from the image of the new Atlanta, but it had been built too well. It was just too expensive to tear down, and so there it sat. In the middle of our community, bars in the windows, vines growing up through, a place where all sorts of unsavory activity and people gathered, went on. A blight on our community. God did a wonderful thing one day. He dropped an idea, just seemed like an idea into the spirit of an Episcopal priest who had just stepped down from a church and wondered what he was going to do next. And we were driving around the community and said, I think God wants me to work with the poor. Rich guy that had it born with a silver spoon in his mouth. I said, sure. And then we looked at that old priest. He says, what, what's that? And I said, that's the old Atlanta stockade. He says, let's look at it. And he said, my, wouldn't this be a marvelous place for the homeless? And I said, oh, I don't think so. He said, oh, yeah, he said, he said uh, this, could be, this could be really pretty magnificent. And so we said, well, let's at least, you know, check the idea out. And so we invited a group of seven architects who had designed much of the skyline of Atlanta, different firms in the city, for a, um, a walk through the old Atlanta stockade. They, none, of, none, of course, had been there at all, had seen it from the expressway. But as we walked through that monstrous, oppressive concrete structure with, with graffiti of all sorts on the walls and glass and needles and other paraphernalia all over the floor, these guys looked at this massive concrete structure and, and began to salivate. I don't know if you have ever known an architect before, but this is a strange breed of people. They see things that don't actually exist. And they looked and they saw some things and they said, oh my, this, this could be magnificent. And I had happened to get a hold of an old set of hundred-year-old blueprints of the place that was now brown and flaking away with age. And I, I said, would this be uh, of interest to you guys? And it was like I was handing them the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
It was like sacred parchment, and they rolled that out, and they said, oh, this is... So and about an hour into the discussion, they said, what, what kind of a budget are we working with here? And I said, well, uh, money's really, it really isn't the issue. I said, if you, if you need to know, we have $3,000 in the bank. And they reacted pretty much the way you're reacting. And I said, ah, I can see you guys haven't built anything by faith before, have you? And they assured me that they had not. And I said, let me tell you, if you use your God-given talents to accomplish this vision, I'll bet we have raised $200,000 right here today. And they said, we'll get back to you on that. It was over the next two weeks that I learned a very important distinction. The difference between the chaff of bright ideas that just sort of gets wisp away by Monday morning's busyness and the kernel of vision that when it's dropped down into the soil of the human spirit it begins to heat up and take on a life of its own in it and it forces itself up through to the conscious attention of the bearer and you can't get away from it you know about those visions the spirit of God had dropped the kernel of vision into the spirit of seven architects and they couldn't escape it and two weeks later, they came back together and they said, our firms have all agreed. We can do this together, pro bono. They said, we have to have one very important condition on this, though. We have to have a very friendly relationship with the general contractor because none of this stuff is standard or code. You just can't draw enough lines. we got to work hand in hand. Who's your general contractor? And I said, well, who do you know? They knew them all. They'd worked with all the general contractors, the commercial contractors that had built the skyline of the city. And I said, share your vision with them. And a couple weeks later, they had, on a pre-dawn February mornings, made a little ramp and up into the prison and had swept a little place down through the aisle and one of the halls and into the warden's office with lanterns along the way. And in the warden's office, there was linen and china spread with a gourmet breakfast, and over in the corner, with a Coleman lantern sitting in front of it, was a great big full-color rendering of what the vision would look like. Twelve general contractors that morning said, we'll commit to it too. And they left that place and went out to all their subs and suppliers and vendors and said, boy, do we have a project for you. I want to tell you that 11 months later, that old prison was converted into beautifully furnished loft apartments for the poor, and there wasn't a penny of debt on it. The good news is not that a marvelous vision happened. The good news that this signals is that there are men and women in the pews of all of our churches who God has entrusted marketplace talents to who have not yet found the way to make connections between those marketplace talents and the work of the kingdom. The church doesn't have enough jobs for them. After they've taught a Sunday school class and served on the elder or deacon board and been on a building committee once and been the treasurer, they've run through the litany of jobs in the church, and none of those jobs touch closely enough to their very well-honed marketplace talents. To discover that the Spirit of God has entrusted them with such spiritual gifts as electronics, as architecture, as construction, as landscaping, as property management, as insuring, and all of those unspiritual sounded marketplace talents to realize that under the Lordship of Christ they are spiritual gifts, it ignites their souls. And when they're done with a project, they say, I have never had as much satisfaction in my life in anything that I've done because I've used my best talent to accomplish the work of the kingdom. That is the force that God is raising up today to which we have access. Now, if
if we have problems thinking big enough, if we're saying, how, what can we do about mixed income housing? Is there a way that we can secure property here so that the poor won't be displaced? Is there a way to keep the, the, the taxation uh, reduced for our seniors so they're not dis, uh, priced out of the market here? Are there these kind of issues that we have the cap capability to perform? Probably not. But we can articulate the need to those who do have the capacity in the body of Christ. We are the ones on the front line. We are the ones that God has entrusted vision and knowledge to. We are the ones that can tell stories that make people laugh and cry. We are the ones that can convince people to follow a vision that may seem absurd. We can present outlandish ideas that in the, in the kingdom of God can become reality. We are those people. And we are gifted to lead what must become in our cities a movement of gentrification with justice. My prayer for us is this that we will stay solidly committed to proclaiming with clarity the message of the gospel and that we will have the courage to venture into new territory that God is opening out in front of us and that we will fully utilize the resources and the gifts that he has entrusted to us to the end that both mercy and justice will prevail in our cities. Amen? Amen. Amen.